They want to prove that we can procreate here. The Colony Ending Explained Tim Felbaum brings science fiction, thriller, and fantasy together in his 2021 film, The Colony. This might sound like sunshine and rainbows at first, but the movie dives into futuristic and dystopian themes, portraying life for people after Earth becomes an inhabitable planet. What happens when push comes to shove? The poor are left out while the rich can afford the privilege of sustenance. In this dystopian world, the rich have left an inhabitable Earth to live on Kepler-209, a planet far away that after two generations, they decided to return to Earth as their civilization is dying out due to their inability to procreate. Survivors. Astronauts enter the stratosphere and come across the mud people, those who lived on the planet, who are pretty hostile. The protagonist, Blake, maneuvers through her situation, eventually finding out about how horribly the Keplar treated the mud people and finally takes a stance that can save the remaining populace on Earth. The movie stars Nora Arnazetter as Black Louise, Ian Glynn as Gibson, Sebastian Roche as Father, Eden Goff as Neil, Bella Bating as Myla, and Joel Bassman as Paling. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Are you still with us, Blake? The Colony Plot Summary Mankind has abused Earth with its wars, diseases, pollution, and unsustainable lifestyle for millennia, turning the planet into a wasteland. To avoid its consequences, the ruling class has escaped to Kepler-209, but the new habitat has gradually turned them infertile, unable to procreate. They decide to come back to Earth after two generations. An exploration team is lost in its journey to Earth, while the second team crashes through the stratosphere where only Blake, Nora Arnazetter, and Tucker, Soped Didersu, survive. They learn that the poor people have survived in the wasteland, but the life expectancy is hardly above 30. The surviving populace, aka the mud people, live up to their name as they've presented like tribes and indigenous people. Felbaum subtly portrays what the evils of classism and colonization, as the Kepler look like a sophisticated group of people, while the mud people are unkempt and rather uncivilized. Following the death of Tucker, Blake allies herself with Myla, Bella Bating, and her mother, Narvik, two mud women. As the bigger fishes eat the smaller ones, she learns that they are being pillaged by a larger group of mud people who wish to get on the good side of those from Kepler, hoping to reap its benefits. Not only do the people from Kepler wish to recolonize Earth, but they also want to take over its resources, once again. It's imperative now that we bring our people. Blake meets with Gibson, Ian Glynn, and his family who welcome her. She finds out her father, Sebastian Roche, has passed away, but through Gibson's adopted son Neil, Ed and Goff, she realizes that she has been lied to and that her father is in fact alive. She discreetly tries to meet with him, but Gibson tells her about her father betraying the Kepler for the mud people. Initially, she's aghast, but as the plot progresses, Blake sees how horribly Kepler treats the survivors, especially the women. She finds out that Gibson has the women locked up and they are subsequently raped for procreation. Meanwhile, Blake finds herself to be fertile once again. Startled by both revelations, she switches her stance and decides to help the survivors and allies with her father. Paling, Joel Baseman, a survivor who has allied with Kepler, acts as an obstacle in her path as she tries to save Myla and her mother, Narvik. She frees the surviving women from Gibson's base while his son, Neil, is taken to a hub from where Gibson intends to send the message of successful fertility to Kepler. Blake finds out that Neil is her blood brother and saves him by tackling Gibson underwater eventually killing him. The movie ends with a heartfelt conversation between Blake and Neil. Without transmission, none of this even matters. Why did the Keplers want to return to Earth? After surviving for two generations in Kepler, the ruling class realizes that they had become infertile due to Kepler's climate. Therefore, procreation was not possible. However, they did not want their civilization to die out so they sent astronauts to Earth with a device called the Biometer that helps determine whether a person is fertile or not. Their agenda was to use the Biometer to record their findings and then, via a hub that connects the Kepler, transmit the message to the planet. If they were fertile, 
the ruling class would once again return and repopulate the planet. However, their desire did not end there. They wished to exploit the Earth for its resources once again, which basically meant that they would do the same thing that resulted in the planet's demise. She was called Mother Earth. What was Blake's relationship with her father like? The protagonist, Blake, is shown to have a very loving relationship with her father. He was the one who would teach her about the Earth. He would tell her about trees, oxygen, fire, and the other elements such as wind, water, and earth. Before leaving for his expeditions, he handed Blake some matches that he was given to by his own father, asking her to light one of them as the second moon passed while he would do the same. He promised that on lighting the last match, they would meet each other again. Blake hopes to find her father when she reaches Earth, but Gibson tells her about his demise. However, when Neil shows her a plant he has been growing, Blake asks him where he learnt about trees from. Neil tells her about a man who he talks to from the pipes, and Blake goes down there to find her father. But Gibson tells her about him betraying Kepler and leading a rebellion after falling in love with a mud woman. She turns her back on him for the betrayal, but eventually, on finding out about Kepler's treatment towards the women and their true intentions, follows her father's footsteps and decides to free the survivors from Gibson. Predecessors failed us in so many ways. Are they coming? Who was Neil? In the movie, the audience first meets Neil as Gibson's adopted child. While having dinner, Mune, Neil's mother, tells Blake about Neil's complicated birth and how Gibson had saved them. During her pregnancy, the umbilical cord had gotten wrapped around Neil's throat, but Gibson found Mune in pain and helped deliver the baby with C-section. He then tended to her wounds and made them his family. Gibson has attempted to turn Neil into his idea of a civilized, upper-class Kepler, even though his mother is one of the survivors. Neil had a secret relationship with Blake's father, communicating with him through the pipes and sending him gifts, such as his artworks of sea creatures. In return, Blake's father would educate him about the same things he would tell Blake about, such as the trees. During a climactic moment in the final few minutes of the movie, Neil is held at gunpoint by Gibson himself. This is when Blake learns that Neil is her half-brother. As her father had allegedly fallen in love with the mud woman, Blake realizes that Neil is his child with Mune. She fights Gibson under the water to save Neil from being killed. Towards the end, she passes down the last matchstick, which she had not lit to Neil. Keep an eye on her. My daughter. Where is she? How does Fellbaum tackle colonization in the colony? The divide in class between the Keplers and the Wasteland survivors have been made evident by Fellbaum, especially in the scene where Neil is excited to have a fishball and is immediately chided by Gibson for using his hands as he makes Neil use a knife and a fork like a civilized person. The theme here is not very black and white as the Keplers inhabited the Earth once, but the Earth did turn into a wasteland due to the exploitation of the ruling class. To make things more apparent, the Keplers wanted to return to Earth and exploit its resources once again, repeating the same cycle as before. Not just that, but they treated the surviving inhabitants in a ridiculous fashion, using their women to repopulate, including the kids. This acted as the turning point in the movie, where Blake decided to switch her allegiance. The Keplers see the surviving class as inferior people. The survivors do not dress like a group of sophisticated people, and they have their own language. They do not speak English, but we see Gibson trying to anglicize Neil and discard his original ethnicity as Neil is never seen speaking in his mother tongue. Even though the ruling class lived on a planet amongst an incompatible climate, they still had better lives than the surviving class on Earth, which really brings out the contrast between the two sides. Technology efforts fail for both men and women. They want to prove that we can procreate here. What was life in Kepler like? During a scene where Blake meets several children via Gibson, they ask her questions about life in Kepler. There are no trees, no lakes, no rivers, and no nature. The people in Kepler have simulations where they can swim. They live in biodomes and use respirators to go out. A biodome mimics the climate of Earth scientifically so that people can live there without the help of respirators. It is unknown as to how they were able to sustain the technology necessary for survival for almost two generations without any access to proper resources. Them being the ruling class acts as a plot armor for their sustainability in Kepler, but other than that, this is something that felt like a plot hole in the story. 
came to Earth on the first mission. Are there other plot holes in the colony? Another massive plot hole in the movie is that of life without trees. Mankind needs oxygen to survive, and that's where trees come into play. Let's assume that the elite Keplers had enough resources to procure oxygen for their respiration, but even on Earth, there are no trees. And yet, there are inhabitants who live without external technological help. The idea of trees is a very prominent one for the plot as Neil growing a tree helps Blake realize that her father is still alive. Towards the end of the movie, when Blake and Neil have a heartfelt conversation, they talk about seeing trees on Earth once again. It could be possible that due to a drastic change in climate, people have evolved their respiratory systems to survive in the present conditions, but once again, such a dramatic biological change is seemingly impossible within the course of only two generations. What is for the many. A key theme in Fellbaum's The Colony is the concept of for the many. This means that those in Kepler must put their personal emotions aside and take every action for the people as a whole and for the survival of mankind. This is first dealt with in Blake's flashback scene with her father. Throughout several scenes in the movie, the phrase for the many is repeated by many Keplers. Their society is supposedly one that cares less about personal emotional value and more about collective sustainability. However, Blake's father breaks this when he falls in love with Rune. Blake carries his torch as she decides to protect Myla and save the other survivors from the Keplers. Her mindset shifts from a brainwashed state of caring about nothing but the many to one where she makes her decisions based on her emotional state and finally puts her first foot forward towards a future that is more humane. The movie was written by Felbaum, Joe Rogers, and Tim Trachte while the screenplay was executed by Felbaum himself alongside Mariko Minaguchi. The Colony was released on March 1st, 2021. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone. The human race doesn't need us to survive.